Hey everyone, it's really my joy to see you all here today. My name is Roma Jaworski and I am a software engineer working on Grammarly for Windows desktop application together with Vitaly. Uh, together we are working on bringing, bringing the Grammarly experience to the most places where you might need effective communication. It's Word, it's Gmail, it's Slack, both web uh, and desktop, basically almost everywhere. And personally me, I uh, work on bringing the new features to our Windows client as consistent as possible. And I'm very pleased to moderate today's meetup with my beloved colleague Vitaly. We are really happy to see you here at the third day of Grammarly Tech Week. It's our virtual series of events uh, where we share some product and engineering topics uh, with you and it's hosted by our Ukraine team. Hopefully everyone will find something new and useful today for themselves. And as usual, our events are completely free but this time we stand with Ukraine. Uh, can you please uh, show the next slide, Vitaly? Yeah, and as right now we have an ongoing Russian aggression against Ukraine, we would be really grateful if you donate some of your costs to one of the trusted sources to help the uh, Ukraine and our fellow Ukrainians. You can find the, some of the trusted fine funds using this QR code right here. Yeah. Also, let's discuss a little bit the logistics. Uh, right now, we'll have a great presentation presented by, by Vitaly. Uh, and in the end, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for a short Q&A session. Uh, you may find the Q&A tool here in Zoom. So please add your questions there. We'll try to address all of them in the end of Vitaly's presentation. Also, after this like formal part, uh, we will be able to remove our tuxedos and join some informal networking. It would be really, really great to uh, meet all of you. Uh, we'll share the link for the networking session uh, here in the chat later. Uh, also, it should be in your uh, in your email uh, with the approval with the approval for this invitation. Yeah, and also this call will be extended for five more minutes, so everyone can join our networking session after after it will start. Okay, I guess we are finished with logistics. So please, Vitaly, it would be great to hear your interesting presentation. Have fun. Uh, thanks, Roma. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks, uh, everyone who donated to Ukrainian funds. Uh, my name is um, Vitaly, and I'm a software engineer in one of the, 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 the .NET teams here in Grammarly. And today, I would like to share one of the stories how functional or declarative programming uh, and f sharp in particular helped us um, build quite extensible and uh, efficient solution for one of our problems uh, but before going any deeper further let first uh, uh, let me first say a few words about uh, but what is grammarly what is grammarly assistant and for those of you who haven't had a chance to try Grammarly uh, Assistant in any um, interface like browser, desktop, or office application. Uh, Grammarly functionality uh, grew a lot during uh, the last years. And uh, today, uh, uh, our real-time suggestion help identify, uh, replace these then sentences uh, uh, with the, like efficient ones, reduce repetitiveness, um, show you the most probable parts of the tag that uh, your user uh, pay more uh, attention uh, to. It can be uh, like help identify uh, the tone of your message and many, many more. And like this uh, sophisticated text analysis is uh, using 
uh, advanced machine learning and deep learning techniques, and uh, also latest research in adv advancements uh, in the natural language processing field. And so one of those places I mentioned before uh, where Grammarly system works uh, is a Windows desktop platform. And the team I'm a part of, uh, as also as Roma mentioned, uh, we develop uh, a product offering that is called Grammarly desktop for Windows. Uh, and this application um, uh, that can be installed on uh, your Windows machine uh, gives uh, all that rich uh, system experience in almost every uh, other application on Windows that has a uh, text editing feature in it. And with all that said, uh, I believe we can begin our journey and find out uh, what, uh, how these two seemingly unrelated things that can uh, Unrelated things that can be uh, combined. Uh, uh, BNF notation, extended BNF notation that is commonly used uh, to describe programming languages and uh, other complex uh, structures represented as text at um, desktop delivery mechanism that help to deploy applications to millions of users. First, let's start from second part where like what problem are we trying to solve here? Um, here we have, uh, for example, um, some structure uh, of uh, web application with the client server communication scheme. And we have an abstract user that has help of uh, web requests back and forth, um, solve um, solving their business problems. On the other side, um, we have a set of micro or a regular size services as a backend that help that is helping uh, this user to uh, solve uh, their needs. And let's imagine that we have some issue or a bug on one on a couple of services. And uh, because of these services are running on our machines or machine that uh, on, on the cloud that we can control, we can relatively easy and fast replace uh, that uh, those broken code, the broken code. Uh, and the, in the simplest case, we can just simply uh, replace the, the, the executable uh, on one or more services. Uh, or, but yeah, uh, in more complex uh, situations when modern um, backends, we have uh, a set of interconnected services and we have uh, like orchestration, balancing and so on and so forth that helps us uh, again solve this uh, uh, bug, bug fixing problem as transparent to user as possible. And if you look on the other side uh, of our our uh, scheme uh, for desktop application, we may have like a large number of users, millions of users that have various versions of our application. Some of them latest one, some of them not. And the, like, the key difference here is that executables are on the user side. It's not that easy to place a code with an issue or to return back the stable version uh, on the millions of machines um, in the reasonable uh, time. And for example, another example would be we have some uh, like uh, particular uh, recently uh, released version like, like, and we have like bug detect detected and we don't want to uh, update everyone to some, some version, but just those users with broken version. Uh, another use case uh, would be uh, that uh, We'd like to install you uh, somewhat experimental build to some uh, a fraction of users to test some new features maybe or improve uh, their experience with our application in other ways. Um, another reason also can be uh, some technical limitation like uh, old OS version or uh, some other software uh, problem that they don't want to allow us uh, to deploy the latest version. And we want to tailor some specific, specific version to these users. <clears throat> and to put it uh, simply, uh, it would be great to have 
ability, some sort of mechanism uh, or solution to uh, deliver uh, to various users the best suitable version of our software. And so uh, the, the usually when looking at the problem, the first thing uh, is to look uh, for an existing solution or um, like try to adapt an existing solution to our needs. So we won't end up in um, investing, inventing uh, something that is already already there. Uh, and unfortunately, it has turned out there are not so many options out there, especially that would fit all our needs. Uh, and the, the main our uh, desire, our need, uh, requirement uh, was to have an ability to make our version distribution decisions dynamically. This means that we have, for example, uh, some limited user context, something like this encoded as a JSON string, the limited amount of user uh, uh, context data. And basically we want to take this context, throw it on the server and get an exact version that current application should uh, update to no matter what. Uh, at the time we had a uh, rather simple uh, approach, a static file with a single version and the Gremlin desktop application made a decision whether to update to it uh, or not. And it was based on some hardwired uh, rules for this particular uh, application version. And we can have like a lot of uh, different rules uh, scattered across this version that make this predictability of the user, the predictability of the end version the user will end up really complex. So, uh, but we wanted to have more deterministic decision maker, right? Which makes, um, which means that make those decisions on our side and the rules are the same for everyone. Uh, and that side is on the server side. There were a few options out there that might help like Squirrel, click once among the popular ones, Google Omaha uh, as well, but most of them had uh, no, uh, no support for the most needed feature for us, dynamic decisions. And those that had um, some sort of it, like Google Omaha, they were closed projects without ability to extend functional tune for our needs and so on and so forth. So it would be harder to adopt uh, such frameworks, frameworks, libraries, or solutions. Um, so to put it simply, what we wanted is to like have a set of these like configurable rules that we traverse and find an accessible, acceptable uh, version uh, for our user context. As none of those solutions could help us uh, cover our needs, we we decided that it's pretty straightforward would be to uh, come up with our own <clears throat> solution that checks all the boxes. Um, we already had some like part of installation machinery, update machinery uh, on the um, application side. So the only missing part was to was the decision maker itself, um, and the simplified were select algorithm look like this. We uh, uh, have a context uh, and uh, uh, going one by one um, uh, through the list of uh, conditions we want too much. <clears throat> uh, and as soon as we have our match uh, uh, with uh, user's context, uh, we know like what, 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 what version we have uh, to uh, say that application should update to. Uh, so the overall like, approach of the traverse algorithm is rather simple. But what would be like the best way to specify those rules to make them uh, really extensible and expressive for us? So are there maybe any decent query languages we can adopt or like, should we create our own? And uh, the second option looked much like joy and fun. So uh, definitely that these were not the only reasons why we followed the past, uh, but uh, yeah, more on that later. Uh, so this, uh, this is how our very specific JSON uh, querying DSL or the domain specific language was born. It was a very telling name, 
update rules, right? Um, the main pros we got out of it uh, were like simple and intuitive syntax tailored for our uh, narrow needs. Um, we have obvious result, uh, uh, what we we um, what we will have in an, as a result of matching, uh, and also uh, like we will have a very uh, intuitive way to uh, make these conditions and to specify them to specify those criteria. Um, so, what what do we want uh, from uh, from the solution. It would be great to have a JSON-like record structure matching syntax because we are working with uh, JSON data itself. It's also easy to remember and to read uh, language syntax if it reflects the data we want to, to, to query. Uh, also, very nature of uh, making decisions dynamically and fast uh, required no additional process uh, for code deployment, reviews, build. So uh, we, we don't want to uh, do uh, to have a downtime. We want to have like dynamically configure those rules uh, in place. That's a bonus. Uh, if we have all the syntax uh, uh, our own, we can tune that, tune that in, any, uh, in any way we want um, and living uh, the set of rules are the same, just like not not something we wanted, but uh, what we get as a bonus. And so, end result of the syntax design process looks something like this. So here are a couple of rules, uh, how they look like. Yeah, and so uh, look at that in more detail. Uh, here we have um, the most intuitive syntax for JSON fields matching. Uh, it fully mirrors the way we are actually accessing them in JavaScript or uh, JSON itself. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we really benefit out of it when we accessing some deeply nested fields, right? So just accessing them without any additional syntax noise. Uh, and as a side, we have common types we usually have in JSON and JavaScript, string, bulls, numbers, and so on. And the only difference is the missing null value in each type as we want to have missing values as a category though we may have missing fields uh, and we are checking their <coughs> existence instead of missing values <coughs> also arrays of all those types would be great to have as well <coughs> Sorry. and the next thing we need having um, the way to access to match fields uh, and having Values itself is to combine them and to specify uh, exact like condition we want to apply to, to, to those um, to say to both uh, the fields and values. So uh, we would like to have three main things here: um, uh, ability to uh, compare first, uh, but we want to compare everything, including strings, arrays. Uh, and so on, but with some uh, uh, specific implementation, but all of this on the same type. This gives us more flexibility and more uh, like backward compatibility for some old version on old data. So we can work with that. Uh, also, uh, we have collections, so we would like to have uh, uh, and strings as well. We'd like to have ability to check uh, that something is in our collection or some string contains some string and so on. So here we have uh, such uh, operators in our syntax. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we uh, don't have null values, but we can check whether some field exists. And it works really well. And it covers even um, like it covers um, Backwards compatibility as well for us. So some field might be missing in old uh, context. So we can check for that as uh, also. Uh, and it would be quite limiting to have to just um, ch to check just a single criteria uh, criterion. So uh, we would have would like to have also uh, ability to combine them and saying that this and that or this are 
this or that. Uh, so and and or logical operators. And finally, the part of the query that state that uh, the outcome, like what, what the outcome should be, the exact version of our application uh, that we want to send back. Uh, yeah, and it's quite important because you have all the pieces in one place, um, like the, the query, the criterion, and the uh, actual results. So you just can uh, go through a single string and know what's going on exactly. And so uh, here we are. Finally, we can like, use that notation I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, all the decisions I mentioned before, um, we can formalize in this notation, but there is no actual need to do so for such a simple query language, but it significantly helps to structure all the things, uh, all the syntax parts uh, in, uh, in your head. And you can use it as a cheat sheet in the future uh, to design your types in a hosting language as well as uh, parsers, more on that a little bit later. So, uh, okay, so we uh, now have a precisely designed for our needs syntax for our small uh, query language, but maybe we can just reduce something already existing as um, I was asking at the beginning, maybe there is some query language that can, we can adopt or adopt, adopt or adapt for our needs. Uh, and the most, one of the most obvious choices would be using GraphQL that works uh, specifically on um, querying uh, JSON uh, data on uh, in no, SQL databases mostly. <clears throat> so uh, let's imagine that we have like simple user's context with a single textual field. And we don't have, as far as I know, in the GraphQL standards, uh, ability to check existence of the field, uh, but some uh, libraries have, and even though they have this ability, you have to like know the exact rules how you can do this. Uh, it's not that intuitive, it's like special field names and so on and so forth. In our case, it's just a simple like this, and uh, that's it. And uh, if you are unlucky enough and have some complex structure like a uh, list, some uh, array of uh, nested objects, it becomes even more noisy. Uh, in this case, I mean, we have uh, to know of more nuances, uh, again, to uh, do what we need. And this not mean that the GraphQL is uh, something, uh, something, so that something bad is with uh, GraphQL. It was just designed for adjusted general purpose language and it has rich functionality for like majority of cases. And our small ESL is tailored for our needs and we can do whatever we want. <clears throat> yeah, and so uh, to sum up uh, all the alternatives uh, in general, all other query languages or simply uh, all, uh, other solutions like uh, um, uh, link you like, uh, uh, code uh, specifications that allowed to query language. They they were or too massive, too big to adapt for such a small uh, area we wanted to solve, like to adopt a new language for just a small purpose and to learn it. Or they were they required code deployments, and, or uh, they were too bloated and too unintuitive for our needs just to, it would be harder just to adopt them than to come up with something we, um, we can design ourselves. Well, and uh, finally we done with all the preparations, all the reasoning, all the conclusions, and uh, we can start our implementation itself. Uh, but what are the crucial parts then if we decided to plan ourselves, what, what do we want? Um, so we plan to process uh, these rules, right? So we can have them in text, but we want to have them in uh, our hosting language where we're trying that we are, we are going to parse this structured data. Uh, in. So 
we would like to have that representation in our hosting language, and that would be having some kind of abstract syntax tree, uh, and the, like the, the root type that reflects our uh, data from the spring. Also, it would be nice to have ability to fully encode all our invariants uh, in the type system of this language. So we won't have to do some second guessing, some ifs, and so on and so forth. So we, so we have all like this resulting structure and it's correct and we don't need to additionally think about it. Uh, we'll uh, look at this, what, what, what I mean a little bit, a few slides later. Uh, and another thing, uh, it'd be great to have automating parsing because uh, we are not solving uh, like the parsing and query language problem. It's just a tool for us to solve our context matching in an expressive way. So we would not want to go any like deeper and uh, to, to uh, do something by hand. We want to uh, uh, have the most automated way doing this as possible. And as a result, we have such options. So we can encode our syntax tree in both C-sharp type system and F-sharp type system. Uh, but due to lack of uh, some types or discriminated unions in C-sharp as of now, uh, we um, would have to uh, give up some strictness and correctness where it is. And it's like connected to our second point of correct by construction as we cannot express uh, our like alternatives, let's say um, uh, in this case in a like very type safe way, right? Uh, also, it would be great to avoid external uh, parsing. We have this uh, have uh, two options for parser generators. We can um, like take uh, uh, notation. We we were uh, uh, mentioning a few slides back uh, and just generate code out of it. Or we can have a library with a, a very expressive. API for constructing parsers, and then we'll have this like parsing thing inside our hosting language. <coughs> so uh, uh, we end up with um, highlighted decisions uh, uh, because of uh, because we want more correctness in this case and more useful more. An expressive uh, parsing. Uh, we are choosing uh, F sharp and parser combinators here. And <clears throat> uh, to be fair, uh, once C sharp gets uh, their case classes or discriminated unions, some sort of, it would be not that obvious choice. Uh, uh, C sharp already has um, parser combinators libraries. It, looks uh, a little bit different, maybe not that beautiful as in. <clears throat> Uh, F-sharp, but uh, yeah, uh, that won't be such obvious choice in the future, I think. Uh, yeah, so what, what is parser combinators for those who <clears throat> don't know uh, or have like no, no chance to look uh, into them? So parser combinators, it's, it's like a whole family of libraries in uh, various languages inspired by parsec library written in Haskell programming language. Rfparsec is an implementation uh, in uh, F-sharp uh, ecosystem. It has familiar API with, uh, with the rest of uh, the family, but internal implementation is different. Um, it doesn't actually matter that, that, that much. Uh, and <clears throat> the case specific of this uh, libraries is uh, this embedded DSL uh, that uh, allows us to um, create our parsers nicely inside our language and <clears throat> without any additional external uh, tooling. Uh, yeah, so the, the main reason why, why we are we were choosing uh, parser combinators is that we wanted to avoid all the uh, external um, integrations, code generation, CIs, and so on and so forth, additional efforts to integrate into the results of, of that. Uh, generation into our language. So it's uh, 
more maintainable and more uh, like in our case for <coughs> our case uh, to choose uh, something that works inside our hosting language. So we can start here um, uh, with um, first um, with our types. Uh, what do we want to um, like what it would look like in our language? Uh, the result of uh, parsing uh, like each part of our uh, of structure of our update rule um, uh, query, query. Yeah, so uh, to design these types, we can again use uh, notation that we prepared beforehand. If you look closely, we may uh, notice that basically everything has its correspondence. And thanks to F sharps expressive type system, we are able to easily translate predefined structure into the code. So just uh, using it uh, backwards. Uh, and so finally, we can move to our parsing phase. Uh, as we decided to, sorry, as we decided to move with parser combinators approach, it's better to familiarize self with what, what are the basic concepts. Uh, here we have two, two parts, basically parsers and combinators so parser is like regular parser uh, approach that we are seeing in that not everywhere like parsing integers out of strings so basically that means that we are processing less structured data stock string or text in our case and get more structured one and again in our case extract syntax tree for example or integer in our initial example. So um, as uh, for combinators, uh, the name says, says, says for itself, it basically means that we're going to combine something. And these things are like the only restriction is that these things are of the same type as well as the result of this combination is of the same type. We can roughly imagine an arithmetic operation as on integers as combinators and the uh, integer would be our common type and we can combine them uh, to get our final result. Uh, so in even in Factorio, uh, famous at least, I hope so, construction management game, uh, there is such a such kind of combinators. And so, um, as integer is a simple type uh, and uh, we have arithmetic operations on them, we can go one level up. So we are going from simple type like integer to generic types that can be parameterized by, by other types. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so for, for those of you who had a chance to work with F sharp, you might already know that you can like, combine functions uh, without executing them and that, that functions for combining function also called combinators. So, so that gives us a more intuition. Uh, and so turning back to parsing and um, combinators library, uh, such type for us would be our generic parser type that can be combined uh, combined in various ways. So if you go back, if you look closer uh, at the type itself, we can see that it's actually a function that works on a stream of chars and returns result our domain type or an error uh, that says what 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 is wrong with our stream of characters. Stream of characters might be like static stream or real stream from network or some, some file source and so on. <clears throat> and for example, um, uh, we can uh, take simple uh, simple example uh, that we want to parse. Uh, like this piece of text uh, um, with uh, which uh, which is enclosed in parentheses, and we are trying to sum uh, two numbers, and we just want to get uh, those numbers out of this structure and uh, do some operations uh, as a result. Uh, and first of all, we have to uh, create simple parsers that do the actual parsing work, uh, like pchar. So we can combine them later. And it takes, uh, pchar takes a single character and returns parsers that can process a stream of characters and move parsing forward. So we can like, do the next thing. Um, 
in case it encounters specified character or uh, it can report an error if something is not there. Uh, and this example, we're making two parses for to detect parentheses on both sides of our central expression. And without any additional combinations, combination combinators, uh, these parses can only consume a single character and only on the start of the stream. So we have to have a way to say where they should be located. Uh, and to make it work, we, uh, as expected, we can uh, use our first combinator. It's uh, called between, and it takes three parsers. First of first two of them, uh, uh, first two of them uh, just match uh, like the beginning and uh, match the starting uh, the start of our uh, string and the end of our string, whatever that is, uh, and the. The uh, third parser um, uh, is the uh, configured parser that, that matches uh, what we have uh, inside uh, those enclosing uh, parsers. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, and finally, uh, like we can uh, uh, construct our central expression like what what we expect to see inside uh, of those two uh, and uh, it's made of uh, two uh, it's made of two integers and we are using pay, pay int parser that just matches what number in this place and also spaces uh, already existing parser that just matches any uh, number of spaces. And so uh, uh, using all these primitive things, uh, uh, we have to have a way to combine them to say we, in which order we can uh, expect them in our uh, textual representation. So the only thing is missing is like the most uh, use category of combinators, the glue that allows us to encode the flow of the parsing, as well as what parser data we would like to keep or discard, we don't care about it. And so the main purpose is to, the, their main purpose is to take two parsers, apply them sequentially, and uh, by doing so, like specify the exact order, what we um, expect uh, our substructure would look like. Uh, yeah, and one, if one of them fails, then uh, all parsing fails and stops. Uh, and it, some parsers may uh, not just uh, assume some structure for like in our uh, parenthesis example, we don't actually care uh, about the, the, the character itself, right? But we care about those numbers. Uh, so uh, in some cases, we would like to take the data with us and uh, to process uh, it later. Uh, yeah, so that uh, in the naming of uh, uh, these combinators uh, tells us exactly this, uh, what data that we parsed with, um, with our parser, uh, the first or the second, both of them, uh, we would like to take, uh, we would like to preserve and take uh, uh, propagated for, uh, forward. Um, so returning back to our like, central expression, central part of parsing on point one, we said that we would like to parse integer first, then it can be followed by spaces. As we don't care about spaces parsed, we, we just want them to be there. We're only taking the integer, integer data with us. And on the two, we are doing pretty much the same. But that on the left means that we are propagating in further our number, our integer that uh, we captured in the point one. Same happens on the uh, point three, but we just making sure that we have plus sign. And on the four, uh, we are we are saying that we care about both sides, everything that propagated from left and um, on the right we have our number as well. And so, uh, uh, yeah, and at the, at the bottom, we can see that as a result of our parsing, uh, configured our parser, we get 
two numbers and then we can interpret them in what, any way we, we want. And so if you put these two things um, uh, together, we started seeing that mm, the structure of the string itself uh, and the parsers reflect each other and we uh, pretty much easily can understand what's, what's going on and what structure we expect to match with these parsers. And so having all this tool set uh, uh, and some more uh, primitive uh, parsers and uh, as well as combinators, we uh, it's quite straightforward moving from simpler for simpler combining uh, uh, all these parts together and uh, uh, moving up and up and generalizing everything uh, into our final uh, parsers that can parse our uh, structure uh, as a whole. As uh, again, as we are using our handy notation for designing our domain types in, in almost the same way we can use it to implement our parsers. Uh, so for, for example, we can look at uh, a, a look at yeah at version, let's say, uh, and uh, can see that the structure in our notation is translatable to the structure inside our uh, parsers. So just knowing the corresponding primitives, we can match the two and uh, uh, configure uh, and like specify all the things needed for our parser, par parser to be uh, to be complete. Uh, yeah. And so um, also uh, two more things worth mentioning. Uh, first is that uh, we have a really like, useful ability to specify our own custom error messages for parts of our general structure that we would like to provide more domain specific perhaps errors to our end user of our prior language and so that won't be just the, like this chair character is not expected at this position but something more understandable for the end users that this like we expect result here we expect this structure here here we expect some pass to our field and so on and so forth so this is really and a feature for to have uh, to like make uh, our lives easier uh, the second thing um and this what we like exactly wanted in our uh, initial requirements is uh, Correctness by construction. This means that we can like map all the primitive types that we parse because uh, parsing library doesn't know anything about what what our domain types types are, uh, and so if we won't do this, uh, we end up with a complex structure of uh, tuples deeply nested with various kinds of primitive data. I mean, have to <clears throat> we have to do the second uh, second pass on this structure more structured but again not our final representation and we would would, would would need to do the second passing and that again can be error prone and we can miss something and we have to maintain this and so it's really nice and cool to have feature that uh, combinator that just maps uh, simple data data on the go and as we are moving forward with parsing we are mapping uh, at the same time in our domain type and then the final combinator just uh, becomes a parser from uh, string to our final uh, final type. So yeah, basically that's what I'm saying. Uh, so as a result, we have this beautiful function that looks like a simple uh, integer try parse but but with better better types yeah uh, so we, we can have parse a function to process our string and have a, uh, either update rule our domain type or error message that says what's wrong and where in case 
our string does not represent our rule. And here, sorry. Yeah. So here we can see uh, what we would get if we parse some real uh, update rule from text. Uh, and uh, here, uh, uh, like it's fully, fully constructed type. It's not some 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 um, combination of parts. It's uh, really uh, constructed uh, all at once, uh, and really really looks cool. Um, I think uh, that we we are able to do to do so. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have this. Uh, finally, we have this. Domain group presentation. So we solved our problem to uh, process and text, and now we can work with actual uh, actual data structure. And here, like nothing really uh, interesting happens. We just uh, just uh, going through our uh, structure uh, uh, using. Uh, all the, uh, the all of its parts and trying to match uh, all the requirements that we encoded as inside this type with users uh, context. So here are a couple examples like uh, we have uh, nested condition processing that, that we might have uh, and or uh, in various uh, rules uh, also uh, existing check uh, or uh, various kinds of uh, comparison and so on and so forth. So again, everything looks uh, uh, really uh, like really understandable, uh, very readable, uh, I would say. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is that uh, uh, type system won't allow us to miss something, right? We have all the cases, all the, uh, everything that we expect to see, we have everything here. And if we add some new conditions, we have to uh, uh, satisfy them in every place that we were using them. Uh, that's the nice things about f -sharp type system. And so what is the query language without syntax highlighting? So to look like more real query language, we can add a simple syntax highlighting. For example, in Notepad++, um, there is an interface for syntax highlighting for any new programming language that is not on the list of already supported. Other editors has uh, some similar ways to do this, uh, in, but in perhaps textual, uh, textual way uh, to configure this. Uh, and so as a result, we have a uh, or a simple query language fully recognized by the uh, editor. Yeah, with all the important parts highlighted and all the structure highlighted. So, yeah. And so um, to wrap up a little bit, uh, after using uh, this deployment system, basically using rules and matching. Um, and then with context and uh, on doing this on the server, uh, after using it for a while, we are pretty happy with all the flexibility it gives us and like low maintenance cost. As all the configuration how it happens in our DSL and it's expressive enough to cover most of our needs, if not all, without any uh, any additional code deployments and all that process of uh, additional process of pipeline CI and that's one so first. Another thing is as it turned out that building and uh, integrating simple DSLs, uh, the keyword here is simple, uh, integer solution is not something exotic and can be done really uh, relatively quickly. Implementing something like this uh, may takes uh, from a couple of days to maybe a week for uh, experienced F-sharp developer without any additional knowledge 
of uh, parsing, uh, f parsec, and, and so on. Uh, the API is pretty straightforward. There are a lot of examples, so it's pretty easy to um, familiarize yourself with such an approach. Uh, among other interesting things, it's the fact that we had like not a single production bug yet. Uh, thanks to like functional declarative uh, approach uh, of the F sharp itself and including uh, like powerful type system. Uh, and combining this with F uh, per sec parser combinators, uh, this technique opens up doors to like unique possibilities of uh, complex um, structure uh, analysis and uh, represented in text. Uh, that, might be uh, not something um, that, that might be not any well, really uh, programming language itself, right? But some perhaps maybe uh, complex uh, st structure, some complex logging, or some complex uh, file with data that you want to process in a useful way in your uh, hosting language, and you can leverage this technique as well. Um, yeah, so with all that said, uh, I believe uh, that's uh, it for this part. Uh, in case if someone uh, are interested in more uh, details and information, I have a few uh, useful um, links here. Links here. Um, among them uh, is a link to the blog post. It describes this uh, like adventure in, but in written form. Uh, additionally, you can uh, find the link to the repository for implementation of the toy query, logs query uh, language that they prepared for some um, other talk of the day. And it, it has all the uh, all the parts, starting from parsing, uh, parsing combinators, um, interpretation, data types, and so on and so forth. Uh, so anyone who is interested can uh, look into that. And uh, if you liked uh, all of this uh, even more, and you'd like to work with uh, various other uh, functional programming approaches, you can just simply contact us using uh, this QR code uh, to find uh, open positions. Uh, or you can do this on our website or any other way. That would be uh, uh, easy for you to do uh, in, any, in any other way. Uh, and now that's probably it of all these things. Uh, and thanks everyone for following along. Uh, yeah, so perhaps we have a few minutes uh, for questions and then we can go to the networking chat. So yeah, for... thanks, Vitaly. Sorry, uh, did I interrupt you? Yeah, yeah, uh, go on, Roman. Thank you, it was very insightful, it was very cool. Yeah, let's check the questions. Just to remind, you can ask any additional questions via the Zoom Q&A tool. You should have a button at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, let me check, we have a few. Okay, I guess it should be interesting. Uh, can you tell us, Vitaly, uh, how this Thing, this solution is deployed. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I briefly mentioned this, but basically, like that's perhaps maybe not the most boring part. Yeah, but uh, actually, this <clears throat> is simply deployed on um, uh, uh, Amazon Web Services as a uh, Lambda function. And it's if you want to um, have a server but don't want to do anything, that's like the perfect work, a perfect option for you. So basically, yeah, uh, that deployed as uh, a lambda on uh, uh, Amazon Web Services and uh, it just basically runs all, all this algorithm by matching a set of rules with the uh, user's contacts and returns back. Um, uh the resulting version uh and uh, like interesting thing that uh, um amazon has all the things needed for uh dotnet uh and uh, for even f sharp templates 
for uh, for the Lambda function, like bootstrapping all these things. So it's pretty easy just to use um, their templates uh, and they have everything uh, in them. Yeah, so uh, that's how this works on the server. Thanks, thanks Vitaly. Let's tackle one more question. Uh, how do we test the solution? Oh yeah, that's that's the interesting one. Yeah, so basically you can uh, have various um, ways to do this. Um, the simplest one is just uh, for the simple uh, like language design syntax. Uh, we have a limited, pretty limited uh, um, set of possible uh, configurations. Right, so we have some uh, matching with this operator, matching with that operator. So we can just, uh, use regular approach of having a set of uh, test cases that covers each feature, uh, and like you know, can have uh, some like dozen of them or, or, or two dozens, <clears throat> and it basically covers all the all the at least important cases that you have. And that's uh, that's it. For it can be a lot more complex uh, uh, way to um, use some property-based test that encode properties of the outcome and result. And it, they, this test just generate very big amount of tests, large amounts uh, of tests, and then can cover like even, even more. But that's <clears throat> like uh, some additional thing to uh, perhaps uh, the, the deep dive uh, into it. So the, like the, the basic question, you can cover this with a regular test, just to make sure that you cover uh, uh, most of the cases. Thanks, Vitaly.